The Ying Lo represents a case where the art of jewelry fashion has imitated sculptural Buddhist art. First seen on Buddhist sculptures, the Ying Lo gradually became an ornament for the maidservants and female dancers of the Tang court. The jewelry of the Song dynasty continued to develop along the same lines as the Tang dynasty, with popular forms continuing. Although the Song has been recognized as a period of restraint in aesthetics, there was a continued interest in large-scale, opulent items. Innovations occurred such as this crown-like diadem for women. Some months after the first expedition on Cat Street, a friend called excitedly to report he had found a cache of excavated gold pieces on offer by a dealer on Cat Street. As soon as I could, I was on a plane to Hong Kong and went straight to Cat Street, where I met the dealer and combed through trays of gold ornaments. This diadem was one of the treasures I acquired on that trip. Surface decoration on hairpins emphasized the natural world. A flowers motif frequently decorated hairpins, associating beautiful flowers with beautiful women. This extraordinary pair of hairpins from the Rubin collection was also part of the initial group of pieces I came to acquire. They are made of gold sheet rolled to form the tines of each hairpin and decorated by the chase and repose techniques to form the chrysanthemum blossom caps. During the song, a conscious archaism on the part of the court hoped to recapture virtues from the past. As part of this trend, the song saw a revival of the use of jade and bronze belt hooks. With the revival of interest in ancient culture, earrings also came back into fashion after apparent disinterest or perhaps social prohibition against earrings for high-ranking women of the Tang dynasty. The earliest ear ornaments found in Neolithic graves were made of nephrite jade. Earrings at the time were not worn matched in material or form. During the Qin and Han periods, the pierced ear fell out of favor. Social attitudes toward ear piercing had changed, as by then the pierced ear somehow came to signify loose morals and served as a reminder to ordinary people to control their actions and behave properly. By way of a hairpin, ear ornaments for the elite were placed by the ear rather than by suspension from a pierced ear. The glass air dung found in a Sixth Dynasty's tomb was actually an ear spool with trumpet-like ends. The hole through its length was used to tie the spool to the ear. The passion for exotica and precious metals in personal adornment, first addressed during the Han, culminated in the Ming and Qing dynasties with wonderfully ornate hair ornaments, earrings, and headdresses. After a decline in the use of ear pendants during the Song dynasty, their use made a resurgence beginning in the Yuan and later even the Ming Empress had pierced ears. Symbolism flourished in the Chinese style during this period. Many of the gold ornaments I have had the privilege to handle in my business were poetic expressions through the use of decorative symbols. The following images of some of those pieces demonstrate the amazing creativity and finesse shown by the Chinese goldsmith. These Yuan earrings were recovered from Yunnan province in South China. It was there during the 13th century that the Mongolians took control of the plentiful gold production. The almost tribal appearance of these earrings reflects the Mongolian taste for bold ornamentation as opposed to the finer detailing 
associated with the Chinese style. Set in the arms of each lotus-seated Buddha is a cabochon garnet. Above each figure is set a bright navette-shaped cabbed carnelian, the earrings tested to over 22 karat gold. Together, they weigh 33 grams. The Manchurian crane is credited by the Chinese with an almost unending life, and as such, is often used as a symbol for longevity. In this ornament, we can appreciate the type of delicacy with which thin sheet gold was manipulated with finely drawn gold wire in order to imbue headdresses of the court with deep meaning. It was during the Ming dynasty that the art of filigree reached its zenith, a driving force for the pursuit of ever-increasing detail and quality of craftsmanship was the enthusiastic patronage of the upper classes. The level of artistry achieved by the goldsmiths of the Ming Imperial Workshop parallels the excellence achieved by the contemporaneous silk workers through the intricate style of stitching silk known as the forbidden stitch. The earrings pictured here are examples of the masterful filigree work done by these masters of the art of the Ming goldsmith. Buddhist influence, once again, is reflected here in the forms of the dragonfish, the origins of which can be traced to ancient texts that describe the Naga of India, a mythological serpent. The double gourd is yet another emblem of long life. Formed from high-carat sheet gold, the gourds were created by the reposé technique in sections, which were then soldered together and finished with gracefully formed wire hooks. It gives me always such pleasure to see photos of artist-musician Joni Mitchell, not least because for nearly two decades she was photographed wearing the smaller of the two pair of earrings, which she would refer to as her daily Ming wear. The phoenix pictured here most likely graced the headdress of a Manchu princess. Emblematic of the empress, the phoenix is often seen with the image of a dragon, which is emblematic of the emperor, who is also referred to as the son of heaven. There was strong interest during the Ming in reaffirming those designs, which had imperial and mythical meaning. Dragons, phoenixes, and assorted floral motifs, which had played an important role in defining early China as a distinct culture, were literally applied to items of personal adornment. Great pains were taken by the court to establish hierarchy through dress with detailed and strict official dictates. This magnificent hair ornament must have graced the head of a lovely bride, as it is richly composed of poetic symbols so appropriate for a wedding gift. The mandarin ducks symbolize connubial bliss and are juxtaposed with pomegranates in the center, which are emblematic of fertility and, in particular, the birth of many sons. Electric blue kingfisher feathers would have been overlaid on the surface of the gold pomegranate leaves, when I first spied this piece in an antique shop's display case, it appeared as a flattened, black and distorted relic. Exposure to the elements and unimaginable conditions resulting from burial for some 700 years had been unkind to the wounded survivor. Only until I held and turned the piece over in my hands did I even realize it was very high carat gold. A single streak of brilliant yellow had been made visible by the dealer when checking to see what lay under the soot and oxidation. This piece, more than all the others, was dramatic, even wondrous, in the process of restoration. The initial cleaning from black to brilliant gold 
was awe-inspiring, but in addition, the delicate wires and mesh that had been flattened for eons found their way back to complete restoration, as if with an uncanny memory for the original construct. After gentle manipulation in the deft hands of my friend, jeweler Reeves McDowell.